What is the secret atmospheric mechanism behind the largest tornadoes ever recorded? How do these rare super tornadoes form? The average width of a tornado is about 275 meters or 0.17 miles. That's about three city blocks wide. Pretty large actually, but they can get much, much larger. The 2020 Cookville, Tennessee EF4, one of the most significant tornadoes in the past five years, was double the average tornado size, approaching 500 meters or 0.31 miles wide, about six city blocks wide. One of last year's worst tornado events, the Greenfield, Iowa EF4, had a peak width of 1,200 meters or about 0.75 miles wide. But we're just getting started. The 2011 Hackleburg Field Campbell EF5, one of the strongest tornadoes ever recorded, had a peak width of 2,000 meters or 1.25 miles wide. The Hackleburg Field Campbell EF5 is literally one of the largest and most destructive tornadoes ever. An incredibly rare, massive tornado event. But what if I told you that there have been a few tornadoes that were double the size of that tornado. There is of course the 2013 El Reno EF3 that was an insane 4,200 meters wide or 2.6 miles wide. And then there's the often forgotten about but just as significant 2004 Hallam, Nebraska F4 which had a peak width of 4,000 meters or 2.5 miles wide. That is absolutely massive. Can you imagine a tornado of this magnitude and size tearing through downtown Oklahoma City? Insane. Now the 2013 Arena Oklahoma tornado may have been the largest in recorded history, but the 2004 Hallam Nebraska F4 was essentially the same size, only 200 meters in diameter smaller. But it doesn't get hardly the same amount of attention as its slightly bigger brother, El Reno. And this is a shame because the 2004 Hallam F4 is in many ways actually more interesting than the 2013 El Reno tornado. Don't get me wrong, I think the 2013 El Reno EF3 is very intriguing. It's one of the strangest meteorological events ever recorded. But there is a few interesting aspects about the Hallam F4 that make it unique from El Reno. And that's the topic of today's video. What were the unique meteorological conditions that came together to create this massive monster? How did a town directly in its path, Hallam, Nebraska, fare? And why do some meteorologists claim that the Hallam F4 should actually hold the title of largest of all time instead of El Reno? That is what we'll be discussing in today's video. But before we get to that, we gotta talk about a major problem in the modern world, and that is data breaches. Time and time again, I hear on the news about large websites and companies being hacked, leading to the release of millions of people's personal and private information. The only problem, these data breaches likely occur several months before being reported on. And if your information was a part of the breach, it's probably too late. The criminals have already had your information for months. But you can have protection from these data breaches with today's video sponsor, Aura. Aura continuously monitors the internet, including the dark web, for your personal information, including your social security number. And if Aura detects your data, they immediately alert you, giving you a heads up, giving you enough time to protect yourself. And if the worst case scenario does end up happening, Aura provides up to $5 million in identity theft insurance so you can have peace of mind. Aura provides more than just ID tracking and notifications. They offer a data broker opt-out tool that prevents websites from selling your information. You know when you Google yourself and you can see your address and your personal information? Yeah, Aura will opt you out of those websites automatically. But that's not all. They also provide a secure password manager, antivirus software, tools to block harmful websites, and a VPN with more than 100 virtual locations. Aura really does provide an entire arsenal of identity theft protection tools, all in one place. And if you'd like to give Aura a try, you can go to my link, aura.com slash soil to get 14 days for free. That will be enough time for Aura to find out if any of your personal information has been exposed. Again, that's aura.com slash soil to get a free two-week trial. Thank you so much to Aura for sponsoring the video. During the early morning of May 22, 2004, the central U.S. plains, especially Kansas and Nebraska, were incredibly humid. Winds from the southeast were bringing in lots of moisture from the Gulf of Mexico. While there were winds coming in from the southeast, there were also cooler, upper-level winds coming in from the southwest. A low-pressure region was gradually getting stronger in northwest Kansas. Due to its limited eastward movement, southern Nebraska and northern Kansas would remain an ideal area for supercell and tornado development. The people down at the National Weather Service Storm Prediction Center saw the potential for a large tornado outbreak and began issuing warnings several days in advance. 
On the morning of the tornado itself, the Storm Prediction Center issued an outlook showing eastern Nebraska and western Iowa as a level 3 out of 5 moderate risk for severe weather. The tornado outlook gave a 15% chance of a tornado developing within 25 miles of any point within this shaded area, including both Nebraska and Iowa. The forecast given by the Storm Prediction Center stated this, Isolated supercell storms will likely develop rapidly over eastern Nebraska and western slash central Iowa by late afternoon or early evening. These storms appear to have the greatest risk for tornadoes due to very favorable low-level shear profiles and a moist boundary layer. And of course, as predicted, during the mid-afternoon, several supercells formed over Nebraska and Iowa. Several small tornadoes formed during the late afternoon in various locations. One of the first was an F1 that touched down over Furnace County, Nebraska. Another F1 tornado touched down in the late afternoon in Fremont County. This tornado traveled along the Platte River and ended up hitting a Walmart around 6 p.m. But none of these tornadoes could compare to what was to come. Around 6.45 p.m. in southeast Nebraska, a large cumulonimbus cloud that would eventually create one of the largest tornadoes of all time was rapidly forming. And I mean very rapidly. Southeast Nebraska was primed for supercell development, and a small cumulus rain shower quickly transformed into a large supercell in just 30 minutes. Oklahoma University meteorology students Gabe Garfield, Jeff Snyder, and Brent Shambaugh were heading west near Fairbury, Nebraska, straight towards the supercell, hoping to capture footage of a tornado at its base. Gabe, Jeff, and Brent were some of the few storm chasers who were able to document the entire record-breaking Hallam tornado. The date is May 22nd, 2004, uh, near the town of, I don't know, I can't remember, Fairfield or Fairview, uh, Nebraska. Uh, I'm heading west on 136, went through Beatrice, got a ticket. Gabe, Brent, and Jeff wouldn't have to wait long. The initial phases of a tornado were beginning to form right as they arrived. Hey, spin! How did that happen? How did that happen so fast? Holy cow! Look at that rotation too. That got its act together and fast. Get your camera, Brent. It's gonna be a pretty Brent, big tornado. Get your camera. That's gonna be a big tornado. The first tornado is not the Hallam tornado itself, but a precursor. While it only briefly touched down north of Hebron, receiving an F0 rating. The motion of the mesocyclone is absolutely insane. Something that the storm chasers take note of. Oh, man, look at the motion! I know! This thing is a beast! The supercell continued to the northeast, and the OU meteorology students continued chasing it down. Even at the very beginning of its life cycle, these storm chasers could tell this supercell was unique. Good. And it wouldn't take long for another, more significant tornado to form. Around 7 p.m., just north of Alexandria, Nebraska, an F2 rapidly came together. This F2 traveled 8 miles, causing minor damage to several homes. Now, one common theme with many of the tornadoes from this storm is that they were surrounded by loads and loads of dust. You've heard of rain-wrapped tornadoes. Well, many of these tornadoes were dust-wrapped, making them often hard to make out. For example, the OU storm chasers did see the very end of the Alexandria, Nebraska F2, but they really couldn't tell what was going on because of all the dust. Something on the back side of that, this, it's a, oh my gosh, it's a huge tornado, man. I can't tell. It's a huge tornado. Finally, around 7.30 central time, the initial formation of the record-breaking Hallam tornado began just west of the town of Dakin. The OU storm chasers were actually in Dakin at the time and were able to capture it on film. At first, it would appear as a beautiful white cone tornado descending from within the wall cloud. Very much on the ground. Locations impacted include Dakin, Tobias, Western, I'll tell you when. Uh, this is a dangerous situation. Act quickly. So he's going to get big fast. Look at how low the backside of that meso. Yep, yep. Otherwise, go to a small material on the lowest floor of the building. Get out of the road. You idiots. It was at this moment that Gabe captured something remarkable on film. So here's the tornado, right? But what is this? Is this also a part of the tornado? Not exactly. This is a rotating wall cloud, aka a spinning cloud extending from the base of the supercell itself. When the warm air beneath the supercell rises, it begins to cool, eventually reaching its dew point where it turns into condensation, and then you have a wall cloud. Really, it's a part of the supercell mesocyclone lowering from the cloud base. But just take a look at this tornado and its parent wall cloud. Like, this is crazy. Look how low and prominent this wall cloud is compared to its parent supercell. And look how fast it's spinning. This is not a typical mesocyclonic wall cloud. And all of this may play a key role in massive tornado formation. So what are the key factors behind the development of extremely large tornadoes? 
Well, there is actually something known as a super tornado, also referred to as a mega wedge. This is its own class of tornadoes. It's an extremely rare breed of tornadoes that is still a bit perplexing to researchers and meteorologists to this day. Let's go back to the 2013 El Reno tornado, the largest tornado of all time, with a width of 2.6 miles. This tornado has been described as a multi-vortex mesocyclone. It was as if the wall cloud itself reached the ground, and inside this wall cloud mesocyclonic tornado, there were dozens of vortices rotating around each other. Like, check out this video right here. This is video from within the El Reno tornado, and you can tell like there are just random vortices all throughout. Another example may be the Birmingham 2011 EF4. Look how close this wall cloud is to actually touching the ground. These unique tornadoes have been called ground scrapers. Check out this insane example from Henry Swartz filming a tornado in 2016 in Woodburn, Indiana. absolutely insane like the wall cloud is on the ground spinning rapidly like it the whole thing looks like a massive huge tornado is the whole thing a tornado is it a, a, its own unique meteorological event either way it's an incredibly rare tornado formation keep all this in mind as we return to the Hallam tornado supercell it was now 7:40, and the Hallam f4 had been on the ground for over 10 minutes often obscured by nebraska dust as Gabe and his fellow storm chasers followed the storm, the mesocyclone wall cloud does seem to be getting closer and closer to the ground. At this moment, Gabe and the other storm chasers pulled over to the side of the road. They're not exactly sure what they're looking at, but they're filming the entire mesocyclonic wall cloud. At one moment, a tornado appears to form on the left side of the mesocyclone. There it is coming down to the ground on the backside. Come on, let's go a little bit further, further north and east, man. A few moments later, another stovepipe tornado forms on the right side of the mesocyclone. What a two! What a two! It's worth noting that at this time, the National Weather Service stated that the Hallam F4 tornado was over a mile wide. These two tornadoes are clearly not over a mile wide. So what are they? Are they satellite tornadoes? Are they perhaps two inner vortices that are soon going to be engulfed by this entire massive mega wedge? I don't know. Gabe and the other OU storm chasers headed east in an attempt to catch up with the tornado, but unfortunately it was getting increasingly further away and darker outside. Around 7.55 near the town of Western, they witnessed from a distance the tornado double in size near the towns of Wilbur and Claytonia. And around 8.10, the tornado barely clipped the town of Wilbur. Several homes and buildings were partially destroyed within the town. But thankfully, the main portion of the tornado was still over a rural area. Around this time, the Storm Prediction Center upgraded their convective outlook, now showing a level 4 out of 5 high risk for severe weather. The tornado probability map also increased to a 25% chance of a tornado forming within 25 miles over eastern Nebraska or western Iowa. In fact, in the report they stated, tornado outbreak in progress from eastern Nebraska to central Iowa. The tornado was nearly 2.2 miles wide at this point, already breaking records. As it continued to the northeast, it struck several farmsteads near the town of Claytonia. It was around this moment in the tornado's life cycle when it strengthened from an F2 to a more significant F4. When it moved into northwest Gage County, close to Claytonia, it caused the most intense damage. Numerous farmsteads in the country were devastated by the high-end F4 strength, with the wind speeds exceeding 200 miles per hour. Some estimates were even as high as 250 miles per hour. If this were measured with the modern EF scale, it would be considered an EF5. As the tornado moved into Lancaster County, it maintained its F4 intensity. The tornado would pass just north of Claytonia, but straight ahead was the town of Howlam, and Howlam was directly in its path. Making matters worse, it was getting very dark outside, and the edges of the tornado were getting more and more difficult to distinguish. Even though it was quite dark out, Gabe, Brent, and Jeff did witness the tornado as it was approaching Hallam. But unfortunately, viewing conditions were not ideal, as the tornado was now rain-wrapped. I think there's probably something in the ground over there, but there's no way of telling. Yes. Still, I mean, just an insane amount of rotation everywhere.
Within Hallam, the sirens rang out. It was pretty late on a Saturday, so thankfully most of the residents within Hallam were at home and able to seek shelter in their basements. Hallam would unfortunately take a direct hit, being fully engulfed by the monster around 8.35 p.m. Around 200 homes were demolished and almost 95% of Hallam was severely damaged. There were 38 injuries and luckily only one fatality within the town, a 70-year-old woman. For the entire duration of the tornado, she would be the only death. Hallam's a pretty small community, so essentially the entire town was obliterated, including a train that was derailed just to the south. After the tornado had passed, many survivors walked out of their basements straight to the outdoors. Their homes were gone. Many of the survivors who were left homeless were taken by a bus to Southwest High School in Lincoln. As the massive tornado left the city of Hallam, it decreased in size significantly to almost a mile wide, so still very large. The small towns of Hickman, Firth, Panama, and Bennett were thankfully not within the path of the tornado. While it did not strike any more towns, the tornado still directly hit the rural yet pretty large Norris High School around 9 p.m. This is, by the way, this is a massive high school like out in the middle of the country. Anyway, since the school year had ended the day before, on Friday, May 21st, the building was mostly deserted when the tornado struck. There was one instructor present, Phil Severson, an eighth grade math teacher who was finishing up his final grades. Severson claimed that he could hear the roar get louder and louder and that the entire building began to shake. His classroom only had minor damage, but the room right next to his had been completely destroyed. The roof had caved in. There were 11 other individuals inside the school at the time who were all able to seek shelter and make it out alive. Significant damage was done to the school, including the destruction of the football field, the auditorium's roof, and the school bus barn that housed 30 to 40 buses. Like toys, these buses were flung all over the school property. On the roof, some of them were on the track, there were buses everywhere. It would take about a year to complete all the repairs, and during the 2004 to 2005 school year, the students had to study in a remote location. After heavily damaging the school with F2 strength, the tornado clipped the town of Bennett, Nebraska around 9 p.m. It was near the town of Bennett that the tornado caused F3 damage to a few rural homes. Finally, around 9:10 p.m., the record-breaking tornado dissipated in rural Otto County, Nebraska. Mike Johans, the governor of Nebraska at the time, took a tour of the region just after the event. According to him, the destruction was among the worst Nebraska has ever seen. The National Weather Service estimated peak wind speeds around 250 miles per hour, giving the tornado a high-end F4 rating. Of course, I did indeed search for remnants and destruction on Google Earth, and there are a few empty lots, a few slabs, a few random sidewalks going nowhere, um, but nothing too crazy. The town actually did a great job of rebuilding in the years after the event, and to this day, you really can't tell that a tornado went through it. All in all, the tornado lasted 1 hour and 40 minutes, traveling a massive 52 miles. Total damage estimated to be over $160 million in 2004 money, close to $210 million today. The Hallam F4 held the record for the largest tornado ever documented for almost 10 years until it was dethroned by the 2013 El Reno EF3. But Hallam is still quite unique when compared to the El Reno tornado. In fact, one could make an argument that technically the Hallam F4 should hold the title of largest tornado ever recorded, as it does hold the record for the largest condensation funnel ever recorded. What does that mean? Well, a condensation funnel is the funnel of the tornado. Tornadoes are full of different, you know, debris, dirt, grass, structures. But when you witness a tornado, you also see its condensation funnel. That's that smooth looking cloud. A tornado is a region of low pressure, and depending on humidity and atmospheric conditions, the rotating air within the tornado can reach its condensation point. So the Hallam tornado has the largest confirmed condensation funnel ever. It was difficult to see because it was so dark out and so rain wrapped, but there are a few photos out there if you look for them. When El Reno was at its peak size, it was really just a massive cluster of inner vortices, all rain wrapped, so the exact shape was hard to define. That's why when you look at pictures of the El Reno tornado, it kind of just looks like a chaotic mess. And that's because it was a chaotic mess. Going back to that video from inside the El Reno tornado, you can just see the inner vortices all over the place. But El Reno was never fully organized as a full-on condensation funnel like the 2004 Hallam F4. Either way, both tornadoes are insane weather events, and they do both belong to the class of super tornado slash mega wedge. So what are the factors behind these mysterious mega tornadoes? 
Is it the mesocyclonic wall cloud reaching the ground itself? Is it just intense winds surrounding the tornado kicking up dust? Perhaps it's just a cluster of tornadoes, kind of like the Greenfield, Iowa tornado, all within like this, you know, dusty, like, I don't know. Please comment your theories below. And with that said, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time.